I, I figure we'll start with uh, introductions. Uh, I think, uh, Adine, if you want to go ahead and give a brief introduction about yourself. Hi, everyone. I'm a senior associate in the New York office. We're very much jazzed about the AI. I think we're part of the founding members of the group, so that's really exciting to be all together. Um, and yeah, just really excited to be here. Uh, when we were first assigned to this panel, I was like, oh, ethics. But then when we really got going, it's going to be very interesting. So really stay tuned. Great. Thanks, Adine. Uh, and Stuart? Uh, okay, well, since my mom's not here, I'll just say I'm a partner in Fenwick's IP practice, and uh, I've been doing this for uh, a, no a number of years on the AI side. That's all I'll say. Great, thanks. Hi, everyone. I'm uh, Zach Arned. I'm an IP and tech trans associate in Fenwick. Uh, and yeah, a super AI nerd and very excited to get to talk about all these fun, uh, tricky AI ethics issues with you guys today. So to give you sort of a, a roadmap, we're, we're going to be hitting all kinds of stuff. As Stuart alluded to, we may not be able to sort of plow through everything, uh, you know, or if we can, we may not have time for the, the questions at the end, but hopefully we will, because I'm sure uh, there'll be some provocative thoughts that you guys have as we, we cruise through all this together. So uh, in, in kicking it off, I, I thought I would start just by mentioning, so Stanford's High, which is the human-centered uh, AI institute, every year puts out something called the AI Index, which is a big report where they attempt to basically um, measure all manner of things related to AI. And one of them is the sort of topics that are of most concern to executives. And maybe not surprisingly, uh, cybersecurity is like at the very top of the list and has been for the last number of years. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, there's been an increasing trend in AI ethics related topics growing and growing over the last several years as has been documented. Uh, and, and I think because of that, it, it shows, you know, the importance of this area and, and as well that it's an area that's not important just to you know sort of executives of these businesses um but also to all sorts of you know uh, different bodies including the aba uh and so i, I thought I'd, I'd sort of throw it over before we before we get going on that zach i'm just going to say ai ethics is a really interesting topic that's actually not fully what we're here to talk about we're here to talk about legal ethics that relate to AI issues, many of which happen to be AI ethics issues. But I just wanted to keep those two distinctions separate because they really are quite different. So this is le legal ethics relating to AI, a large amount of which are AI ethics issues. Yeah, that's great. Thank you, Stuart. Excellent clarification. So, so to get started, I thought, uh, Adine, maybe I'll have you introduce, uh, you know, something way back from 2019, right? As Vijay said, you know, uh, last weekend feels like 30 days. So 2019, I don't know, is decades ago uh, at this point. Dog years. Uh, yeah, <laughs> dog years, uh, but uh, an important, uh, you know, sort of resolution and report uh, that the ABA put out. Yeah. So back in 2019, they were focused on how lawyers and courts can use AI as like an internal tool. I know we spoke about the distinction between that. And so they were focused on three key issues, uh, bias, ethical and beneficial usage of AIs, and control and oversight of AI. And that last one's really focused on audits. And they have a list of targeted questions that you should ask AI vendors before implementing it into your practice. So I'd highly recommend looking at this if you are going to be using AI tools in your practice. And one salient example that came out was a court was thinking of using an AI chat box. But in doing that, it could potentially uh, discriminate against people who are visually disabled or visually impaired. So they suggested having also an audio interface to that. And I thought that was really interesting because they're thinking about how AI can be accessible to all classes. Yeah, great. And then, uh, Stuart, I thought I'd kick it over to you to sort of bring us up to speed all the way to 2023 in February when they sort of issued a renewed report. Right. So four years later, um, there is a report that basically came out with a res resolution on two fronts. Uh, the thing that I found really interesting about it was it didn't talk about the fact that the Iowa Ethics Board you know, said, no, a lawyer can't do this or anything like that. It actually wasn't related, again, my point, it wasn't related that much to legal ethics. It was talking about the interesting issues in AI, how complex they are. And the two resolutions were essentially warning that judges and lawyers should be really mindful of all the new complexities that are out there because they kind of change a lot of things and that prosecutors in criminal cases should be aware of that as well and take note of that. But but I found it most interesting for what it didn't talk about. And this sort of, you know, I've been practicing a lot of years here and um, I, I remember how slowly, glacially, the legal ethics relating to 
email use by lawyers progressed. There was discussion for, I want to say, half a decade for whether lawyers could email with clients. And, you know, eventually it, it got there and it's ridiculous, right? And, you know, life moves on. Sometimes lawyers don't quite get the memo at first, but eventually catch up. And uh, and here it is all over again. And I'm sure that was the case with cell phone usage again, but that was a little bit before my time. No, that's great. So uh, next we want to dive into something, you know, very pragmatic, you know, these practitioner specific concerns uh, of which they are myriad. Um, and for the first one, I thought, you know, we think for lots of legal practitioners, they think, okay, what's a cool use, you know, I might do, I could use ChatGPT or some similar large language model, you know, ask it some questions and things like that. And as many of our panelists previously alluded to, there's this issue of machine hallucination, which uh, actually way back when deals with this image back on the right. This was when sort of generative image AI was just becoming developed. Uh, this this comes courtesy of uh, Google's uh, Deep Dream, uh, which is the Mona Lisa and puppies, you know, very like far out. Um, but hallucination was actually a very good thing. You wanted machines to hallucinate and how things have changed right now in this world of large language models for, oh, hallucination is something very bad and something to be avoided and a, a very robust problem. Um, so, so that sort of springs to mind is particularly relevant for legal ethics for, you know, a number uh, of uh, potential concerns. One of them deals with this meritorious claims and contentions uh, sort of rule that we're subject to, uh, with a big point noting that you have the obligation to inform yourself about the facts, uh, you know, related to your client. And a potential use case is, you know, you to say, GPT, hey, bring me up to speed on, you know, X related to my client. Well, it might be hallucinating some facts that, you know, aren't really sort of, uh, you know, uh, actually true, in which case you will have violated this particular duty. Uh, in addition, or sorry, in addition, perhaps more obvious, uh, the the duty of candor, you know, here is relevant. Where uh, you know you have to be able to make statements that you believe to be true on the basis of reasonable, diligent inquiry. Uh, and again, if it's just something that gets spit out of a model, and we know there's this tendency towards automation bias, people to just trust whatever the machine says, uh, that that puts you at you know substantial risk to uh, of, again violating you know this particular rule here. Now, uh, I, I, to throw this over to Stuart, I feel like this is a, a great time, and uh, I think I'm forgetting which presentation earlier set us up, but they noted, you know, make sure you consult with a all caps human attorney uh, about something, and you might think, oh, that's not a distinction that uh, perhaps needs to be made, but uh, in fact, it does. And Stuart, why don't you tell us a little about the unauthorized practice of law issue? Sure. So, uh, for those of you who have looked at unauthorized practice of law issues before, the do not pay title may suggest you don't have to pay that lawyer because they're not actually authorized in that jurisdiction to pay. But that's not where do not pay actually comes from here. Do not pay is a company that used to give people tips on how to get out of parking tickets. And do not pay came from here's how not to pay parking tickets. But it could equally be drawn to the UPL issues of um, lawyers outside of their jurisdiction, or in this case, <laughs> things that aren't lawyers at all. And the class action here talks about the fact that, you know, all, all the horror stories you might imagine of a robot lawyer, uh, it's advertised as, you know, use our robot lawyer to do all manner of things to, you know, whether you want a lease, whether you want a non-disclosure agreement, whether you want to figure out how to avoid liability for, you know, something or other, you can use our, our robot lawyer. And, you know, obviously, um, because of the hallucination effect um you know it's about as good as you might expect you know if you used wikipedia and looked up something on wikipedia and based your entire case your entire defense or whatever you're doing on what you learn in wikipedia you know in eighth grade you get hammered for doing that you shouldn't be doing that with your own you know with your own matters uh at, at all and so um uh, it is a good example of where people are thinking that, oh, this is AI, this will be great, um, which um, I, I'm going to come back to a recurring theme several times today. And I, I want to say that with each of these dangers or risks that, that we mentioned, I also want to mention the fact that there is so much potential for good from AI in connection with the legal profession that 
there is a huge risk in not using it. In fact, a lawyer has an obligation to inform the client about matters and means of getting to a result. And if you don't know the details of what can be done, then you're still not doing electronic discovery. You're still not doing, you know, you're charging clients much more than you need to be because you're not taking advantage. You're using a typewriter, for goodness sake. Um, So anyway, um, we're going to have these bumps in the road. But with every one, I want you to think about, yeah, but really the choice is, you know, what, what are the downsides of not doing anything either? And that's the comparison that really should should be made. Yeah, that's great. And the, the do not pay, you'll you'll note, he may have put a target on his back to some degree for those who are familiar with the story. So for instance, he offered a million dollars for any lawyer to put in a little earbud and let ChatGPT, uh, you know, dictate what they say to argue in front of the Supreme Court. Uh, and when you publicize something like that, uh, you know, lawyers uh, tend to pay attention, um, you know, so uh, there's uh, sort of ways to mitigate risk, you know, a- outside of, uh, you know, the staying within the confines of the legal rules. Um, uh, additionally, Stuart, I thought, you know, it'd be good to hear about the the duty of confidentiality as well. You know, we know some of these tools, you know, Harvey and things like that. being Sure. So, we'll, yeah, we'll talk about that for a second. So another thing that this was mentioned earlier today as well but it needs to be reinforced whenever you submit inputs to these systems you have to assume that they will be used not just for your query for your prompt but they will be used for other purposes as well there are very few instances where that's not true and you've also seen that if you put in a certain prompt if you put in an andy warhol like campbell soup can prompt you're going to get something that looks very similar same thing if someone else puts in a prompt that's very similar to the one that you were using for your client they're likely to get something similar to what you may end up using and so there are all kinds of issues with losing control over client confidences and so forth that you really need to be careful you need to review terms of use and there's also a lot of discussion about how these early years these transition years for ai use by law firms they're going to involve a lot of returning to trusted vendors you know don't try somebody brand new who really doesn't do this think about the folks who've been dealing with law firms for years and dealing with you know automation of legal services for years who understand that there can be problems if information isn't handled confidentially and and properly and and they will you know hopefully it's the old when in doubt by ibm kind of thing because they probably know how to handle these issues better than somebody who's brand new whether that's true i don't know but i think that's a trend yeah no that's great so, Dean, you know, let's say I'm thinking about, you know, sort of using one of these tools, you know, we know about this unauthorized practice of law issue. Are, are there restrictions that people are putting on these tools for what you can do with them uh, as legal professionals? Yeah. So a lot of these tools do have a contractual restriction, at least, that says that you can't use it to uh, give guidance or advice on law unless a qualified individual reviews it. Um, So you have an ethical duty as well not to engage in the unauthorized practice of law. And then one salient issue that came up actually last week for me as a client, they had a customer enrichment tool and they were thinking of developing it further for a Saudi Arabian entity. And so they want to know the implications of doing that. Of course, I could sound smart and savvy, type the question into chat GBT, um, but first OpenAI has a restriction on doing so unless a qualified individual uh, reviews it. And second, I'm surprisingly not barred in Saudi Arabia. So uh, I would be also <laughs> violating that ethical duty. Great. Um... And uh, one other thing that, you know, uh, I think you sort of touched on when saying, uh, hey, I could be super smart and, you know, type this into chat GPT, but there is this obligation also for us to have this duty of competence, right? And actually what makes you so super smart is knowing that, oh, I, I shouldn't be doing that because I know, you know, the limits of these particular tools. Yeah, that's incredibly important. Um, and so we sometimes get clients who ask us, hey, can I use ChatGPT to draft a terms of service or can I look up an answer of the law? And we spoke at length about the hallucination effect. And 
even when you ask it to cite examples of an article, there was one time a UCLA professor asked it, hey, give me five examples of harassment with references to articles. It cited a GW professor with a, a Washington Post quote um, that he harassed a student in 2018 on a law sponsor trip in Alaska, and that was blatantly false. Uh, and the professor was like, I've never been on a law school sponsored trip. I've never been near Alaska in 2018. And that's pretty problematic. So you do have to realize the hallucination effect. Another one is that the initial output is very linear. So as you see with ChatGPT, it goes from line to line to line to line. And honestly, there is some beauty in craftsmanship for a lawyer, a human lawyer, to look at the output or and even look at a terms of service and be able to think like, hey, if I change a definition here, how does that change the contours of a document? Or if I need to tweak something to unique or bespoke to my business model, ChatGPT may not be able to do so. So that's another area where we as lawyers can provide additional insight and have that duty of competence to our clients. You know, Adine, this really reminds me of the fact that in, in our practice, a, a lot of our practices involve forms of different types or things that are are often used and where there are forms it's typically considered good practice in a decent law firm to put all kinds of warnings around the forms for the the firm's lawyers to say hey don't just you know copy this and send it to a client because this might not make sense in many 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 situations you have to look at the particular use case and figure out whether everything that's in here is still sensible. There might be some footnotes and so forth that help guide the lawyers to, you know, toward that path, but it's not one size, but, you know, there's a lot of art as, as you're saying. And so that's really, really important. And that's part of the duty of competence. Now we chose the ABA model. I, I wanted to mention that for purposes of this discussion, we're not talking about jurisdiction specific, um, Ethic, ethical rules, rules of professional responsibility, but the ABA model rule 1.1 is duty of competence. California rules of professional responsibility 1.1 duty of competence. It is it is high on everybody's list. Okay, competence and diligence often mentioned together are requirements of uh, all, and and that you're not being diligent if you're just copying and pasting from something else or if you're having. A machine do that for you um you know at, at some point we're probably going to talk about emily bender professor emily bender's work up at uw on uh, uh how a lot of these things are just stochastic parrots and you know they're very good at just sort of grabbing stuff that's been done before parroting it back with just a little bit of change um that's probably not how you want to practice law yeah, great point. And on the the copy paste, you know, sort of risk, you know, one of the other considerations is this, you know, sort of, uh, you know, legal duty of zealous advocacy, and recognizing that a lot of these large language models put out, you know, relatively neutral, you know, sort of tepid responses, you know, because that's what they're designed to do. But that might not actually suit your use case as a lawyer, or if it does suit the use case, it's not something that should be decided by the default of a machine. It's something that, you know, sort of legal expertise should have, you know, sort of actually intervened on. Um, so there's, there's sort of lots of these different areas that it touches on. Um, next, we want to touch a, another big issue, uh, which is bias. But before you do, oh, Zach, please. Sorry, I'm sorry, I just I got to <laughs> do a, an upside of AI again here for a second. It's always good, though, to have starting points. And as long as you know that you're just getting a starting point, these tools can be great. Just don't trust them. You know, just like you wouldn't trust a law review article from eight years ago because the law may have changed. It might have been a great article at the time. It's just not current and you don't trust it. But that doesn't mean it's not a, oh, wow, that's the first time I heard about that concept. Has that developed? And, you know, there's shepherdization. There are all these tools that you can use to figure out what the current state of the law is and, uh, and get up to speed on it. So great for starting point. Yeah. And, and on the MA side, we use Kira which is an automation tool. And are, do we trust it automatically? No, we have human staff attorneys, associates vetting and auditing it to see if it's correct, but it is, it really expedites the diligence process. Yeah, that's great. Um, so, okay. So with regard to bias, obviously this is a, you know, a, a very big topic here. I think as was mentioned before, this is something that's top of mind for lawyers based on the, the very recent sort of joint statement that was put out by the FTC, the DOJ, the EEOC, uh, the CFPB, and noting that this particular joint statement was specific to 
uh, uh, discrimination uh, and the particular enforcement actions they plan to take on that for uh, uh, bias. Um, so right, really noting that, hey, this is an issue front and center for those particular regulators, and we you know want to make sure we're, we're sort of thinking it through and all the possible exposure there could be. Um, uh, uh, Dean, we have some great graphics here kind of representing some of the, the issues that uh, some of these uh, generative AI systems run into. Can you kind of uh, talk us through uh, you know these issues related to bias? Yeah, I mean, we really wanted to show them. Uh, they're pretty powerful images. Uh, when we first came up with this presentation, I was like, we have to show these images just to see how pervasive and how it can mask this bi these AI tools can mask bias. So when you type in manager to stable diffusion, all white men. When you type in compassionate manager um, into stable diffusion, you get, you get some females. To me, they give a cold and just not warm <laughs> vibe. I don't think they would be compassionate, except especially the top two and the bottom one looks a little scary. Um, so, and then you get no one of color, no diversity. And so you really see uh, a little bit of bias there. For Adobe Firefly, and if you guys don't know, it was trained on a corpus of data that's licensed and that they have the right to use, plus images in the public domain. So great job and props to them about that. But when you type in wedding photo outside daytime, you get these images and all white again. Um, so no same sex marriage, no people of color. Um, and then you get a weird gropey vibe from the guy. And I just like really don't like that. Um, so yeah, it's crazy that in 2023, these are the images that are produced. Yeah, so clearly there can be problems with the tools. We noticed that regulators are sort of very interested in getting involved. Uh, Stuart, can you tell us maybe a little bit about soft law in this area and uh, you know other sort of uh, you know not kind of directly regulatory uh, efforts that are being made related to bias? Yeah, sure. So uh, it, it all started really in sort of twenty. It's pre-COVID time, so you know years before COVID, I guess. Um, 2018 or so, there started being a lot of discussion about sort of responsible AI principles. And they were all stated in, in very academic sounding terms and so forth. But pretty much they universally included notions of bias and fairness and, and things like that. Um, as things have evolved, uh, there's a, an evolving sort of moving from academic thought about this to actually actionable things and um in europe of course they're doing hard regulation the european ai act is is working its way through we have some matter of piecemeal legislation uh happening as well but largely we are involved in um a, a lot of areas where there are things that aren't actually the statutes they aren't actually case law that are driving us instead they're things like the ieee the folks who normally come up with standards for things like, you know, how many milliamps can go on a USB-C, you know, pin three or something like that. They have the IEEE standard 7000-2021, which is a standard for developing systems that uh, sort of are, are responsible. And they include things like making sure that you've got, you know, all potential stakeholders at the table, making sure that people from the uh, sort of public relations group at the vendor company to you know sort of everybody who touches new development thinks about all these issues and you can you can either meet tests that show that you achieve um that you achieve certain thresholds or that you have processes in place that are intended to achieve certain thresholds including very prominently things like things like bias um uh I don't know if we're going to talk about it separately, but NIST, the National Institute for Standards and Technology, has both a risk management framework that includes all of this stuff. It also has a risk, it also has a bias uh, discussion, which is wonderful. And, and how it relates to legal ethics is it's wonderful in the geekiness that it has. It talks about what drives, what sort of technical details drive bias we all know some of them we know you know the training data shouldn't be for you know criminal records from mississippi in the 1960s that's not going to be you know a good thing to, to use uh but it's it's things that are much much more technically detailed and depending on what you're doing as a lawyer to make sure that 
that the results you're getting are usable, you may want to either yourself or get an expert to go ahead and help decipher everything that NIST has in that um, in that sort of white paper on the technology that underlies bias in AI systems. It's it's wonderful for that purpose. Yeah, that's a great point, Stuart. And and I thought I, I'd do uh, an attempt at the, the sort of Stuart plug here for the good side of AI is <laughs> noting that uh, humans can also be very biased, right? I mean, Stuart mentioned the criminal justice system in the 60s, right? Not the paragon, uh, you know, of unbiased uh, perspective. Um, and uh, machines have the ability to potentially help in that regard. Uh, there's definitely, you know, careful attention that needs to be paid to it. And I think there's a lot of research that shows these solutions need to be socio-technical in nature, right? It can't be just, you know, optimizing, you know, something in an algorithm. It can't be just the people themselves. It's going to be both together. Uh, and I think uh, it, it holds great promise, right, for really, uh, you know, kind of moving forward in a, in a way that's, you know, going to be to the benefit of everybody. So I I'm just going to sort of bring in another aspect here, which is we're talking about bias right now, but this is also applicable to many of the other factors that come into responsible AI. So for instance, if you want a reliability, right, does this stuff actually work? You can also do the same sort of testing on, on that resilience. Is it, is it, if, if there's a perturbation in something, is it going to screw up the entire system or is it still going to work? Just yesterday, I got an email from a vendor for claim chart GPT, which says, you know, you give me a patent, I'll give you a claim chart for the patent and i think it said that i'll also work on giving you prior art references for each of the elements that are there in the patent you know interesting i'm i'm really interested but i want to know what what are the details underneath it and i think lawyers who want to rely on that who even want to present that as something to the client have to do it after having done that diligence on what the offering is to see what it might be good for and what's you know we're super high on the hype curve right now right and so we have to test this stuff ourselves we have to make sure that we feel confident that what we're using is viable for an intended purpose it may be good for some things awful for others so next we're moving on to the topic of disinformation uh, which, uh, you know, speaking of the issue of trust, right, you know, is something top of mind for, for everyone these days. Can we trust our own eyes? Can we trust our own ears? Um, and uh, I think as part of that, we've recognized uh, there needs to be a, a, an initiative, you know, related to data provenance and things like that to understand how these things work. And there's a variety of different, uh, you know, potential solutions out there. Some people have proposed, you know, some form of statistical or cryptographic watermarking, you know, that could be used for the output of generative AI. AI, uh, for platforms, you know, sometimes uh, people have proposed this, you know, like requiring proof of personhood, you know, in order to post something, you know, on that platform. Um, you know, there's radioactive tagging you could potentially use for data. Uh, there's even more formal initiatives. So there's the C2PA standard that the, uh, the content uh, authenticity initiative has pushed forward. So there's obviously a lot of interest in, in sort of activity and, you know, trying to, to figure out how do we establish this and, and fight disinformation. So maybe, Adeen, why don't you kind of, you know, walk us through why that's even something we should be worried about, why we might not be able to trust our eyes? Yeah, I mean, we've heard throughout the day that the ability to generate songs, content, media with all these AI tools is growing at a rapid rate. So platforms and games that had to think about takedowns before, they now have to think about it even more so because it's blurring the line between fact and fiction. Um, and so fake news is really here. Like there's going to be lots of one example that we saw was a deep fake of Ukrainian president. President Vladimir Zelensky, it was calling on his soldiers to lay down their weapons. Like if that were to circulate and people believed it, and if it was an authentic thing, that had, could have a detrimental effect. Another one, not as harmful, but the Pope wearing a white puffer jacket, but it went viral. People were talking about it as it actually happened. And we're definitely going to need those tools that you mentioned before uh, to see like what's real and what's fake, because now AI is here and it's staying. So another another issue on that one that relates to the uh, professional responsibility requirement of competence, you kind of have to stay up to speed on how good these things are, because it could be that maybe you're involved in litigation and uh, an adversary is providing you with an email that looks really bad for your client. You got to be able to think, hey, these are now being generated in a way that that 
look pretty plausible. And, and if there's something that doesn't match with, with other things, test it. Even something you get from your own clients sometimes, you need to be mindful of, of that issue as, as well. So uh, being aware of this is not just, you know, for grins at seeing the Pope in a puffy jacket. It's, it's, it's real. And it, it's important for us to stay up to speed because this is the world that our clients are living in and they're dealing with this stuff and it may impact our practice in ways we can't even predict. Yeah. And as you'll note, right, you know, here, uh, the Pope appears to be holding a tiny little teacup, uh, which maybe is a bit of a giveaway that this might not be the actual Pope. But like Stuart said, this stuff moves so fast, right? The next generation is not going to have little flaws like that. Uh, and, you know, maybe totally undetectable to the human eye. It may even be hard for machines to detect. And we have to, just like you said, stay up to date on how much, you know, we can trust or how much we can trust, but, you know, still required to be ver or trust, but verify, I guess. So uh, next, we're going to talk about the ethical issues and how that's impacting regulation and judicial activity. And to sort of start this off, I want to note that, you know, it's it's interesting seeing the trajectory of ethical issues and that it's largely been an issue that's kind of been, you know, pushed aside in the AI sphere is something that, you know, is esoteric or, you know, sort of ivory tower doesn't really need to be sort of discussed. Uh, and people have more recently recognized, oh, actually, these ethical issues are driving a lot of the regulatory attention, that they're driving some of the judicial uh, activity. And so it's it's really something that does need to be more top of mind. Uh, an example of this, so the California State AG uh, sent uh, numerous letters to hospitals inquiring about the clinical uh, algorithms uh, that were uh, being used and the possibility of bias and discrimination. And this activity was largely motivated by the fact that there'd been a lot of very, you know, sort of popular news stories. Stories, uh, about such technology, uh, you know, resulting in those kind of biased or discriminatory outcomes. Uh, and all of a sudden, you're, you know, have a letter from the, the state AG on your lap. Uh, so, you know, these are sort of issues that we really need to be mindful of, uh, because they may be pushing forward the, the legal risks that we encounter in the future. Before you leave that, I, I think we have to really recognize that there's a tremendous amount of tech clash out there where there's there's real backlash against technology because the stuff that makes interesting headlines is extreme and bizarre and uh, makes it sound as though the technology is not good. Again, speaking to the benefits, it's important for regulators to not be too restrictive and say no, no, no all the time because you do lose out on some tremendous benefits. A lot of times people are just looking for ways to try to break this, which is good. I mean, that's a good thing for the development of the technology, but the things that work really well, the things that help somebody diagnose what's wrong with a tractor's engine or something like that using AI, um, you don't want to lose that uh, because somebody else used it to you know, put in something silly here. No, that is a great point. And we're going to, you know, talk about that later when we talk about, you know, sort of bias bounties or bug bounties in these mechanisms that are actually very important, have been important historically throughout software and now just as important for AI, trying to break them to figure out how to make them better. Um, uh, I thought, Dean, it'd be great if you could talk about a, a, a sort of another group uh, of uh, people who, you know, there have been a, a substantial kind of outcry uh, from some of the ethical uh, elements, and that's namely the, the artists, uh, you know, who are uh, involved with these uh, image generators. Yeah, so with these text image generators, they're using a lot of images, um, and the artists are seeing that their images, the ones that they worked really hard on, have copyrights too. They're being used by these AI tools, remixed, and potentially creating derivative works or not. It could be fair use, um, and it's drawing on principles of fairness. They don't. The AI tools did not initially get their consent to do so. Um, and so that's resulting in some class actions. And the FTC is also drawing on principles of fairness and equity to issue some regulations to make it more AI, more transparent and fair. Yeah, great point. And and the FTC, I think, as has been talked about before, sort of cutely, you know, noted the difference between the fake AI problem and the AI fake problem, yeah. uh, right? And how both of these are going to be important to, to, to keep abreast of. Uh, Stuart, I, I thought this would be a good opportunity to, to talk through um, that recent example we chatted about with uh, the insurance client. Sure, sure. But, but before I do that, keying in on something that you said, Adine, I want to I want to focus on again the, the nature of the technology really matters here, and I don't think people understand that enough. Uh, Berkeley did a one hour uh, webinar, uh, I think two weeks ago. Uh, 
on a lot of generative AI issues. And Pamela Samuelson, who used to be copyright professor at University of Pittsburgh and has been at Berkeley now for a long, long time, is is really up to speed on these uh, things. Um, she described based on how how most machine learning systems work she described that there are some real gaps between what actually happens and what the copyright law provides so there's nobody actually making a derivative work for instance there's nobody actually copying because this is what's happening and so it might be that the law will evolve it might be that judges will say eh close enough uh, the technology is not quite doing it, but it's it's within what the statute is really addressing, or it might not. But but what the technology is actually involved in doing uh, will, in some cases, I think, turn these cases. And it's the early cases that are going to matter, right? Because it's all first principles when you have new technologies, and depending on how the first cases get presented, I think you know. Uh, I think you were talking, Tracy, about some of the uh, you know the early copyright. Uh, uh issues will um uh, will determine what um what happens uh, okay so um uh, changes in uh, law and practice uh on the jefferson memorial in washington um is a quote from thomas jefferson that that talks about how uh one might as well wear the coat a man might as well wear the coat that fit him as a boy as uh, sort of laws uh, that were written in a prior age should be kept for as technology advances. Something like mangling it, sorry, Thomas. <laughs> uh, but the idea is it has to keep pace with uh, changes in our society and technology. And I think that that is really, really true here. Um, I think there's a big concern. You can use whatever imagery you want. Uh, if you're trying to fight the tide of uh, the world that we live in, um, then it, uh, Larry Lessig had a had a book that talked about how you can't have a five mile an hour speed limit on an autobahn. It just doesn't match. And whatever imagery you want, whether it's pushing on a rope, boiling the ocean, whatever it is, you have to have laws match the actual situations that they're addressing. And I, I think that it's important here to be able to help clients get to that point because oftentimes clients are ahead of the law in this and uh, yeah just like of course lawyers ended up using email with clients well you know of course these things are going to happen you're not going to fight that tide yeah that's great and speaking of such i thought it'd be great you know to hear you know i think for you like staying example abreast, yeah the okay. ieee sorry <laughs> no i'll answer your question um so I, I did i did want to mention that uh you know one example of this is that the california insurance commissioner sent out a memo last june so almost a year ago to everybody in the insurance industry saying that you have to make sure that you're not you have to make sure that you're not um doing things in a way that's biased and so this had a trickle down effect where vendors to the in, to people who worry about such insurance things we're all getting requests saying you have to certify to us that what you're providing us isn't biased that's not a thing that it's not a thing that's easy to certify to right you can't you can't necessarily especially with corner cases you can't certify to that so what's a proxy for that a good proxy for that is to say that you're operating according to sort of standards like standards of care right you're you're operating in accordance with maybe the IEEE 7000-2021 standard, or you know, that's, you're doing your software development along those lines so that hopefully that process will catch any, any ill effects or will catch most of them. And that's the answer that you can provide um, to, those, to those downstream customers saying, I'm not gonna certify, because I don't know how you're gonna use it. This is a multi-purpose tool. It's hard for me to say, but I can tell you that we're, that we're doing our r d in in accordance with those standards yeah i love it i i, mean, I think that's just such a great example of you know being abreast of the issues and finding a novel solution for the clients who like you said are, are ahead of where the law is and so we have to really help fill that gap and there's really creative things that can be done uh, in that way 
Um, so next is uh, our sort of grab bag uh, area where we've kind of noted, uh, look, there's all sorts of, you know, activity going on in this space and, you know, very important to sort of stay on top of all of these. Uh, so one thing that I thought I would mention, you know, at the, the outset is this movement towards um, model cards or system cards, uh, or originally there was, uh, they were called sort of data sheets for data sets. And this basic idea is just trying to get at, you know, what are the nutrition labels for these models that we're using or for the data Data that they were trained on something so that we have you know some idea and they're not such a, a big black box to us uh, and, and this is important and has been really the mantle has been taken up by you know lots of uh, you know players out there in terms of trying to improve and promote their transparency uh, hugging face which is sort of like the github for AI models uh, has noted that for any you know really important AI models uh, that it hosts on there it will sort of create and update a model card that lets you know about the harms and things like that so it, it's definitely an area that's that's gained a lot of traction um, one of the other things we, we've touched on sort of briefly but I thought Stuart I'll, I'll have you talk a little bit more about is this idea of building responsible AI policies and sort of you know where you look for for guidance on those so that that's something that is just growing I think a year from now we'll all be pretty settled on that uh, or at least we'll, we'll we'll have an initial baseline that people are comfortable with it will still evolve but uh, but right now there are aren't a ton of them. There's a Heather Meeker, who, for those, you asked a question about open source earlier. Uh, um, you know, she's a wonderful resource for, for that. She has uh, uh, given, I think, a PLI presentation on uh, uh, what should be in um, policies for responsible AI. Uh, there's a lot of discussion about the importance of having a policy that you can actually live with and and perform to. I mean, we've all seen, uh, you know, horrible stories about what happens to companies when uh, they they have a policy that they don't follow. They go do an end run around their AI audit committee or something like that. Um, but um, that that is, it's an area where I think the culture of a lot of sort of startups and Silicon Valley mentality companies it needs to mature just a little bit because it's fine to move fast and break things when the things you're breaking are, you know, cups like I have my water in or something like that. It's not fine if you have a robotic arm swinging around at 80 kilometers an hour and it hits Zach in the head. So, sorry. It's a poor Zach. Yeah, yeah, it's a shame. <laughs> uh, but anyway, um, you do have to think about as, as the implications of these systems become more generalized and sort of more impactful to society overall, um, you do have to have more initial care. You can't just experiment in the wild. And I think that's going to be a lesson to all of us in the coming year. Uh, it's hard because it slows you down. And right now, you, Jennifer and I were talking about this uh, a little while ago. We've never seen anything move this quickly in our careers. Um, it is, you know, it's changing so quickly and it's hard to just tap the brakes, but somebody's going to be unhappy with uh, uh, the legal liability that they'll have if that doesn't happen. So, um, you know, this is all risk management, right? We do this as lawyers all the time and it's just part of, uh, part of the norm. So I'm, I'm just saying that it's early days. And um, if we do this again next year, um, then I think we'll have some much more definitive. I, I like the sound of that. Yeah. Um, I thought, Stuart, it'd be good to have you, you know, maybe tell us a little bit too about the the sort of mechanism of using licenses to potentially, uh, you know, uh, provide some protection, uh, you know, in these uh, sort of situations. Obviously, Tracy talked a little yeah. bit about, you know, rail, rail before, and yep. it's hard to follow that. I mean, what what could you say that she, you know, didn't already cover? Well, but the, the only it, there, there was there was a question about um, open source licenses for for platforms as well, and I think the thing that's really important is that. A lot of the things that you will find in traditional um, repositories for open source, uh, as opposed to repositories that are more common for sort of ready to use AI systems, a big difference there is the use restrictions. It's entirely antithetical to the notion of free software, which was intended to be free for you to do anything you want to with it. 
these licenses, the rail licenses, and you you walk through some of the uh, language, Tracy, um, but they talk about things that you can and can't do, some of which is very hard to figure out, like what you were talking about, Tracy, with the, you know, is intended or has the effect of doing something. Well, it's hard to know what people are going to do with a general purpose tool. And it might have the effect of doing something that is against one of those uh, license restrictions. So, so I think we're going to find um, we're going to find disputes arising with respect to that, and uh, and probably some evolution of those license forms as well. Yeah, uh, as uh, one of our panelists, Arjun, highlighted earlier, uh, the there's sort of certain issues that regulators have taken specific interest in, uh, including uh, you know employment. And I thought uh, this would be a great chance, Dean, if you could tell us more about you know this kind of very important mechanism that's grown up around both those laws and just sort of the notion of auditing AI in general. Yeah, absolutely. And then just to flag on Stuart's point, using automated employment decision tools in the recruitment or applicant selection process is really helpful for a lot of companies. Um, hospitals have come out in COVID saying, like, we just got thousands and thousands of applicants and we had to use these tools to move fast and efficiently. So there are a lot of good benefits. But at the same time, as the EEOC says, it can mask and perpetuate bias and become a high-tech pathway to discrimination, um, which is a scary thought. So one way to combat this is to do audits. And New York actually just recently came out with a rule, it'll be effective in July, that companies have to publish these audits if they're using automated employment decision tools and it tracks on race and sex and how output is selected. So it'll be really interesting to watch. I think a lot of states are going to follow and this is a way to monitor the use of AI. Yeah, that's great. And uh, and there's more states that are coming out with similar uh, such like laws and things like that, exactly. right? Yeah, absolutely. And this brings us right back to the duty of competence, right? You you need things are moving so quickly, but you got to stay up to speed on what's available and what's not available so that you're able to um, advise clients about options. Yeah, absolutely. Um, one of the other things to note that, you know, certain uh, groups, uh, such as the Partnership on AI, have put together frameworks for how to deal with things like this. In particular, they put forward uh, uh, their sort of policy or their sort of their framework for thinking through synthetic media from a variety of perspectives, both from those developing the AI tools, from those using the AI tools as content creators, and from those who are platforms hosting them, uh, and, and noted that there should be sort of different rules and responsibilities for each of those. Um, we also have on here the, the notion of red teaming. I think this is similar uh, to the, the bias bounty point I mentioned earlier, and this issue of trying to, to break the technology. Uh, again, I think Arjun mentioned before, you know, sort of jailbreaking these things, right? That there's all these very clever, you know, uh, ways that people have used to get around this technology that are not readily, you know, sort of apparent. Uh, and having this very intentional focused, you know, sort of group that tries to find out and ferret out, you know, those misuses before something is released, uh, you know, is very important and a great way that you can help, you know, mitigate risk on that front. Related to that is this bias bounty, you know, notion, which, you know, Twitter sort of famously did with one of its image recognition tools that, you know, Stanford has run, uh, you know, similar such uh, programs. Microsoft has one with a pirate theme. I think they call them bias buccaneers or something like that. Uh, OpenAI recently sort of put out their new bug bounty program. So it's, it's clearly a, a pathway that can be, you know, very useful and has been, you know, very successful for helping find bugs in software. And now with this much larger, more complex attack surface of machine learning, I, I think it'd be an area very promising as well. I, I was just going to add that uh, an important point here is to note the impact of what these teams sort of find and human psychology um it, it's amazing if um uh, there have been some studies where x-ray um sort of diagnoses that were done by doctors and by ai systems were compared objectively and then they were submitted to sort of you know second set of eyes doctors to uh to say you know do you think this was right or wrong and they were either correctly labeled as having been done at first by a human or having been done by ai and yeah you know, that 
bias against AI that results from this is dramatic. Um, it's really dramatic where you'd have much better clinical outcomes if you trusted the AI more, but uh, people get completely skewed when they hear who did it. And we're just learning more. AI is helping us learn a lot more about ourselves, about how we really don't do a good job of, of uh, making sort of objective decisions in lots of circumstances. Yeah, I think you're, you're right. The human factors consideration is you know paramount, right? Whether it's doctors who are using the tool, or similarly, whether it's lawyers, you know, who are using the tool as well, right? You know, what level of faith, you know, or sort of trust am I putting in that tool? Uh, you know, is going to be just as important, especially as it gets better and better. It's going to make it harder and harder, you know, to sort of take that extra extra step. Um, the, the last thing we have on here is just noting that there's, you know, also public databases, uh, you know, that have cropped up where people attempt to identify various incidents uh, related to AI, harms related, you know, that have come out of uh, AI systems uh, to make it easy to, to quickly search, you know, and, and find commonalities and patterns and understand where these failure modes of machine learning are uh, to then try and avoid them in the future. Now we're running a little short on time. Should we wrap up or do one more one or two more slides well uh, i i actually think i actually think that we need to give the full hour which is eight more minutes eight more, oh got it okay yeah so we're good okay good no problem we've got at least eight more minutes it's with ethics, ethics, so I we'll that make sure we do this some jurisdictions that don't, started late. don't okay. have a 50 minute rule and it's a true 60 minute rule so okay yeah. eight Can more minutes everybody the then it's cocktail hour <laughs> for the local folks and then it's at time for the New York folks and it's uh, whatever else you're doing for the other West Coast folks. <laughs> So, so for our next topic uh, is AI alignment, uh, which has been getting a lot of attention uh, in the news recently, and we'll, we'll sort of get to that, especially regarding the, the six-month pause. Uh, but before that, I thought it's worth highlighting this um, uh, harmlessness, helpfulness trade-off. And I sort of mentioned this before with the zealous advocacy issue, uh, that there's been uh, somewhat of a, a push to make sure that these models are harmless, right? Because it, it can be very bad if it's spitting out this you know, terrible hate speech, you know, things like that. Uh, but often the more harmless the model it is, the less helpful it can be. And there's very creative ways that people are getting around this. The big innovation, right, has been the uh, reinforcement learning with human feedback, trying to get humans, you know, in the loop, helping, you know, uh, you know, uh, help, help the models to understand, you know, what's relevant, what's helpful, what's harmless. Um, but, uh, but there's definitely this to sort of, you know, keep in mind, just as Stuart had talked about before, this sort of, you know, weighing of risks, right? It, it's all about risk management. And this is going to be something, uh, you know, tricky that we have to think through as we try and align AI with, you know, what what are our internal priorities, uh, and you know what's our internal value system. Um, uh, next, Stuart, I thought it'd be great just to hear sort of you know a, a little bit of a background, you know, on this six month pause. What is it? Why did it gain or garner so much attention? Uh, you know, what should we think about it? Well, it, it's interesting because there are two really strong philosophies pitted against each other here. There's, um, yeah. by the way, there have been. Um, several thousand i think people who signed on to the letter which sounds like a lot but if you think about how big ai is that seems like there hasn't been much <laughs> alignment with the, the letter the, the the idea is hey ai is just moving too quickly let's let's halt all development beyond sort of a threshold level that we have and let's just wait to give things a time time to catch up and as we saw with lawyers use of email it's not going to be six months so that's not going to that's not going to work i don't think um but i i thought that the scholars are really weighing in nicely with this i i remember one perspective was that um you know it's fine to to sort of slow down actually rolling out products to the public production use of products that may make sense companies should decide that on their own you shouldn't slow down the are part of r d necessarily you should keep that going at pace because there are once again tremendous benefits that can come from uh from these technologies and um i just encourage everybody to read up a little bit about about this because there are a lot of there are a lot of commentators uh pro and con for the idea of hitting the pause i i haven't seen it gain a ton of traction yeah, absolutely. And, and, you know, as you noted, right, the R part is, is not just because there's great benefit there, but also because there's potential harm and you need the R in there figuring it out and then figuring out how to fix it. So I, I think it's a, a great point. And so again, relating this to legal ethics directly, um, not taking advantage of a tool that could be used. You know, it's interesting 
NIST in its sort of assessment of risks and bias, it, it has positive and negative numbers to them so that you can say that not taking advantage of something is a risk. And I think that's important to remember. If, if you have a solution out there and you're ignoring it, that's problematic. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the analog, right, would be doctors or something like that. A new technology comes along. Maybe you, you should use it. Maybe you shouldn't. But eventually it gets good enough and you get in trouble for not using it at that point. Uh, you know, uh, Adine, what about the sort of AGI, you know, notion, this artificial general intelligence, like we see that in the, the six month letter and things like that. What, what's going on there? Yeah, it's getting a little scary, at least to me, but also it could be very beneficial to society where artificial intelligence, we're now training it to mimic how humans think. And so it opens a whole host of issues about how artificial intelligence is going to be trained to mimic the human mind. And it could perform inc an incredible amount of new activities, but it is something we still have to think about. Yeah, absolutely. And, and uh, I'll sort of highlight uh, from here to, to look up the chaos GPT. It's a lot of fun. Uh, this is sort of someone who tried to create, you know, like a truly evil AI. It's like, I, I say it's fun because it's clearly failing. It would be worrisome if it were out there succeeding. Um, but but the good news is, yeah, it's not, not destroying humanity just as of yet. So uh, we only had one last area. I know we're just about at time, so maybe we'll sort of uh, just, you know, quickly take a note here uh, that the AI is being used uh, for some potentially very sensitive areas, and this can, you know, bring up ethics as well. So there was a, a Wall Street Journal piece uh, about using AI, generative AI for dating apps uh, and asked, is this a clever hack uh, or is this catfishing, right? So lots of people are using it to write a Valentine's letter, or help them craft their profile, things like that. Um, and it's unclear, you know, is that something really good for the socially awkward person who has trouble describing themselves or is it something, you know, potentially manipulative out there? Uh, maybe it's both, you know, it depends a lot on the use case. So there's there's lots of these kind of, you know, tricky issues coming up. Uh, Stuart, I thought maybe you could talk about the, the Vanderbilt one, obviously very, very thorny. Yeah, uh, you know, um, while there is nothing necessarily wrong with getting some automated help in figuring out how to respond to a tragedy like this, culturally, you can't do it. You know, there's, there's no, it, it's... There are certain things that just are not acceptable. You know, if uh, uh, if you send somebody a wedding gift, you expect to get a handwritten thank you note from them. There are certain things that we expect in society that are going to take a long time to change. And uh, I think people are just kind of getting used to this, just like I'm not sure that we've adapted to how to use cell phones in public you know um I, I don't know that we've figured that out yet whether it's appropriate to have them in certain places and and point to lawyers for you know legal ethics um i, I was on a plane today i still heard somebody before the plane took off yelling about some situation that they had going on in front of you know probably 50 people could hear uh what was being said so um it, it's one of those things where it, it, it's a sensitive area, not because of anything inherent, but just because culturally we take a while to adapt. I'll just leave it at that. Yeah. And another cultural issue um, was when a rabbi used it for a sermon. And he noted that it was the sermon was very well worded. It was intelligent. But just one interesting, not so ethical, but just interesting issue that he brought up was that the AI system what he said is it's not compassionate it can't love and so it's hard for us to bring it to, to bring us together and that's just something so interesting that spirituality is something that's inherently something that's in, inexplicable you can't explain with words so how are you going to train a system to train it with words it sounds like maybe we should end on that that's i don't know how we go yeah. past that <laughs> no topping that okay thanks uh thanks so much everyone oh uh we were instructed i think to remind you uh first of all uh if you have questions that we you know obviously weren't able to get to here we would love to hear them please reach out to us directly you know the people from all the other panels uh again we'd love to see those and thank you all for um attending this uh we hope you enjoyed it thank you